Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you uh, to this uh, wonderful, uh, well, what, what we hope is a wonderful uh, luncheon on the high cost of free parking. I, I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Carlton Christensen. I'm uh, Salt Lake County's Director of Regional Transportation, Housing, and Economic Development. Okay. And I'm uh, very grateful to our staff who have worked uh, to bring this uh, particular event together. And uh, there really is no free parking, and I would say there really is no free lunch. But uh, we've been very fortunate to have some wonderful event uh, sponsors who have helped us defray some of the costs associated. We'd like to um, extend a special thanks to the Utah League of Cities and Towns, the Wasatch Front Regional Council, and the Utah Department of Transportation. They've been great partners with us. We also are uh, thankful for the other table sponsors who you'll see on the little uh, placard in the middle of the table, and we appreciate their support as well. It's been very helpful uh, as we brought together this uh, event. I'd like to turn some time now to our Deputy Mayor in Salt Lake County, Aaron Litvak. Aaron oversees our department and has been a, a wonderful partner as we brought this event together and in the rest of the work that we do in regional development. Aaron. Welcome everyone to this uh, beautiful Salt Lake County venue, the Viridian Library. As you know, Salt Lake County's population is growing and the demand for housing, parks, trails, transportation, jobs, and our natural resources is unprecedented. Remarkably, Salt Lake County is estimated to add 600,000 additional people by the year 2065 based on research from the Chem Gardner Policy Institute. That equates to three more Salt Lake cities or a combination of West Jordan, West Valley, Mill Creek, Draper, Sandy, Holiday, Murray, and South Jordan. That is a lot of people needing land and amenities to live, work, and play. In the big picture, parking is generally overlooked when it comes to planning and community development. However, considering that parking takes up 15 to 30 percent of land in our communities, this significantly affects the, vi the viability of housing, real estate development, and traffic. With mountains and lakes constricting our growth and the demands on the remaining land we have, in we have increasing, it is more important than ever to make wise choices about future development standards. Salt Lake County believes that collaborative big picture planning is more important than ever, which is why we wanted to elevate this important topic. Parking policies need to be considered and thought through as we plan for our future. Um, I'm honored and privileged today to be able to introduce Professor Donald Shoup to our uh, event today. Donald Shoup is a distinguished research professor in the Department of Urban Planning at UCLA. His research has focused on how parking policies affect cities, the economy, and the environment. Professor Shoup is the author of two influential books regarding planning and parking, The High Cost of Free Parking, published in 2005, and Parking in the City, published in 2018. Professor Shoup is a fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners and an honorary professor at the Beijing Transportation Research Center. In 2015, the American Planning Association gave Shoup its National Excellence Award for a planning pioneer, fits in well in Utah as a pioneer. And in 2017, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning gave him its Distinguished Educator Award. Wall Street Journal said, Professor Shoup is the rock star of parking and the Yoda of planning. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Shoup to Salt Lake County. Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, I, I was uh, uh, pleased when the Wall Street Journal called me the rock star of Parker, but I do understand that uh, that's not the same as a real rock star. 
uh, although I am thinking of changing my name to Shoop Dog. And um, uh, I was honored uh, to be thought of as the Yoda of urban planning until I remembered from Star Wars that Yoda was 800 years old. Um, now, I suspect that many of you would be suspicious of uh, getting advice about anything from, a, from Los Angeles. The, the transportation <laughs> is so famously bad there that how could somebody from Los Angeles have anything useful to say? But I think our problems are so bad that uh, we've had time to think about solutions that, I, that will uh, help anywhere, I believe. Um, that here's a picture of Silicon Valley. Um, now, how could people from a state like that come and tell you how to develop your state? Um, uh, this is a, what they call a campus. It's for uh, Cisco, who is, uh, powers a lot of the computer operations that we use. Um, but this pattern goes on all over Silicon Valley. Uh, you even wonder what the address of these buildings are as in the middle of a parking lot. Um, but this development didn't just happen, it's because the city requires it uh, through minimum parking requirements. Um, that uh, like, like all cities have minimum parking requirements, that here, this picture of Cisco is in San Jose, and here are their parking requirements for several land uses. The green is the size of the building, and the red is the size of the required parking. Uh, anything that has a parking requirement of more than three spaces per thousand square feet has a parking lot bigger than the building itself. Um, and you wonder, how do they come to these uh, numbers? Why is the restaurant and the dance hall the same? Um, Say for an auction house, how often do they have auctions? Uh, that is this just for the peak demand that occurs very infrequently? Um, but Silicon Valley is not the only place that looks like this. Uh, here's from close to where we are, um, that uh, a town where you see there's an awful lot of parking. Uh, and I think a lot of this is required, that it didn't just happen. Um, and here's another town uh, in, in this area, that whenever you look at any place from the era, maybe even this place, you'll see more parking uh, than there are buildings. And here are the uh, parking requirements for, for Murray, um, and you could see that that uh, they also require much more parking, <laughs> the space for parking, than there is for the building that the uh, parking serves. So I think it isn't, th these, these land uses didn't just happen. They are required. Uh, the, the, nothing can be built unless it is dominated by parking. Um, and I think the, the uh, planners are, are responsible for this in many ways, or at least they've enabled it, I guess. That's the term we should use. They enable all of this. Here's a publication where you would get data on parking requirements. And parking standards sounds like a good idea. High standards seem like they would be good. Uh, but I, when it comes to parking, high parking standards are not good. Uh, here's the, the booklet. It, it doesn't really tell you what parking standards should be. It just says what they are in all other, uh, in a sampling of cities in the United States. Here's the, um, uh, the eight pages of different land uses for, for, for parking, that every one of them has to have a parking requirement. I think it starts out with the uh, abattoir. This one gets just, just down to what is the, the last one, where you can't see it here, I think it's uh, 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 in, in, the, in the bees. And so it goes on for eight pages. And here's the first page. Um, and uh, the, I think the first one is adult land use. We don't have to say, <laughs> explain what that means, it's for, but there are also adult uh, uh, bookstores, adult, adult massage parlors, and every one of them has to have a parking requirement. So this tells you 
what the parking requirements for all these adult uses are. And that's a picture of the American Planning Association. Is that what they want the world to look like? Is this being held up as a, uh, as a high standard? Um, well, when you look at the parking requirements, each one of them taken alone may seem reasonable. Um, like a barber shop, you know, the barber needs a, a parking space, so the person in the barber chair needs a parking space, and, um, a beauty shop that uh, is somewhat different. Um, they, they, they're, they're, there's gender differences, um, uh, but they all seem to require at least uh, one space per person, except for religious uses, uh, and then they seem to cut back on the requirement. But for everything else, it seems to be the, the assumption that everybody will drive alone. And when you can't relate it to the number of people, uh, usually re related to the size of the, of the building. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, three spaces per thousand square feet mean the parking lot is as big as the building. Uh, and then there's certain land uses you really don't know exactly what should you relate it to. It has to be related to per something. And for a gas station, well, what else would you do? Uh, and for a swimming pool, there's uh, some puzzling land uses that the planners have to come up with a parking requirement. Uh, even for the afterlife, uh, there has to be uh, parking for you when you're on your way out. Well, the problem with this is that the planners, and uh, there are some of you here, uh, uh, they don't know a lot about parking. They learn nothing about it in planning school. They, if they learn anything about parking in planning school, they learn that it gets the, the parking requirements, get in the way of everything they want to do, such as have affordable housing um, uh, or uh, any other land use that they're trying to, to develop, they find that the parking requirements either make it impossible or, or, or they make it extremely difficult. And the, the problem is that the parking uh, is something that the planners have never been educated in because the professors have nothing to tell them. Um, for one thing, they don't know how much parking spaces cost uh, or what the effects are on, uh, or how they change urban design. I think that uh, in a building like this or in an area like this, uh, the parking requirements must have affected the way everything looks or whether it increases traffic congestion. If people on their way to the parking spaces uh, congested roads or how much they pollute the air or now we even worry about global warming. Um, and they have no training. So you can see what a difficult job it is for, for, for urban planners who have no training whatever in how to set a parking requirement, but they're responsible for doing it and pretending that they know how to do it. Um, so I think the problem is that we've politicized what should be a business decision, um, that the people who should make the decisions are the people who are paying for the parking. Uh, and they are governmentalizing what should be uh, market choices. Uh, uh, well, getting back to the, how much the parking spaces cost, uh, which is, uh, certainly should not be ignored when we decide how many spaces are needed, uh, that I took data on the construction cost of, of parking in, in various cities in the United, the United States, and I, it looks as though that the, for an underground uh, uh, space, the average cost is about 34000 and uh, for uh, in a structure above ground, it's about 24000 a space. Um, um, well, can we afford that? Um, here are data on the uh, median net worth of households. Uh, this was the most recent data I could get. We think we're a rich nation, uh, but the median net worth, that is your assets minus your liabilities, uh, was only about $68,000. And for minority households, uh, look how low it was. The median wealth, that is half of the, the, the Hispanic and black population, have a net wealth of less than $8,000. So you're, you're requiring parking spaces for people who, who, whose net wealth is about the third of the cost of one parking space. And yet we, we pretend that we know how many parking spaces all of these people need. 
Uh, many households, uh, including the households of young planners, have a negative net worth. That is, they owe more than they have assets. If they have student debt, for example, uh, they, they, they have negative net worth, but still we're requiring parking spaces for people. So I think that uh, we, we, we devoted a lot of money and effort and land into paying for parking that could have gone for housing. Um, but, um, uh, the, given the estimates of how many parking spaces there are, at a minimum, uh, there are uh, uh, 1,300 square feet of parking space per car, because there has to be parking here. There ha if you're going to go to the grocery store on the way home, there has to be parking for the car there. If you're going to a movie tonight, there has to be parking there. Everywhere you go, there has to be a parking for your car. So there's a lot of space available for parking. Um, but we have much less space uh, per person uh, for housing. So the cars have got a better deal than people do in this country. Um, and most of that parking, although it's very expensive, it's free to cars. And the housing is expensive for people. Uh, so I think we've uh, twisted our, the incentives that we have and the way we travel and what we spend and how many cars we buy and everything else. Um, so I think we've got our priorities all the wrong way around. Uh, we have uh, a lot of free parking for cars and much less housing for people that's very expensive. Well, can cities remove parking requirements? Um, uh, that most of us think that it's, it's well, it's, it's illegal to begin with. Uh, but if we say, well, we should cut back on these parking requirements, what could be done to, to restore a place like this? Um, in Cisco, and here's a picture in the Cisco parking lot. Uh, it's in a beautiful part of, uh, of San Jose. And it's, it's a wonderful place to be if you're a car. Uh, but how, what if you converted some of this to housing for people? We can do anything but Photoshop. So I took buildings from London and said, well, suppose we have what the new urban is called a liner building, a, a building that lines the uh, parking lot. So from the street, you, you, what you see is a real city, not a parking lot. Uh, so if you could convert these um, unused uh, parking spaces into housing, it's right where we want housing. Um, now, I did this Photoshop when I spoke to the new urbanists, so the kind of building they like. Uh, it must have, they must have been just clean. They looked fabulous, but not the kind of thing that would be built uh, on a parking lot in Silicon Valley. So I just took a, a building from uh, Los Angeles, uh, an apartment building with ground floor retail, and said, well, this is probably more like what it would look like. And if you built that, remember, it's all, uh, um, the land is all under one ownership, it's not brownfields. You wouldn't have to build any parking. Uh, and so this would be uh, something that could be done quickly. And if that worked out, they could build more. Um, and if that worked out, they could build uh, more. This is what it looks like in Los Angeles on the ground. It's nothing spectacular, but it uh, 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 looks like a real city. And you could just keep on going, if the planners allow it. But the planners do not allow it. It isn't the planners, it's the city councils. Um, but it's done through uh, urban planning. Um, so I think that there, there are a lot of advantages that you, you could get from this. Because remember, Silicon Valley is a place where everybody complains about the terrible traffic congestion, the awful air pollution, and expensive housing. So if we simply allow uh, people to build all these parking lots, we could get a lot, a lot, a lot of advantages. Uh, that you would uh, create a lot of jobs because we can import cars and fuel, but we cannot import uh, uh, buildings. You know, they have to hire uh, architects and uh, electricians and drywallers and plumbers and everybody else to build these things. Um, and it would increase the housing supply in an area where people complain always about the terrible price of housing. Uh, and you could walk across the parking lot to, to Cisco, so there would be much less time spent commuting. You could, you could uh, spend your time on other things, and we wouldn't spend nearly so much on cars and fuel. 
and we wouldn't have nearly so much traffic and congestion. And uh, it would, when I go to parking uh, uh, conferences, I say it would increase the demand for managing parking. We would have to start charging for this and, and having permits and parking meters and things like that. It would require high-tech uh, parking um, uh, technology. And you can't ignore now that, uh, that it would slow climate change. Uh, but, uh, clearly, our parking requirements, it would be foolish to say that they don't accelerate uh, 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 global warming. Uh, that, would you like it if the rest of the world were planned the way Salt Murray is or Salt Lake City? Or if we were leading the world, if everybody did what we did, um, it, would be, it would be terrible. We would like to see something uh, very different. Uh, so I recommend three reforms. Uh, charge the right price for on-street parking. Uh, that's a tautology. You could object to charging the right price. By that, I mean the lowest price the city can charge and have one or two open spaces on every street. Say, if we, in Silicon Valley, they built on all those parking lots, you'd ha you couldn't leave the curb parking free uh, because they would get jammed up. Uh, so if you charge the right price so that wherever drivers go, they see one or two open spaces on every block, they can't say there's a shortage of parking. Uh, it'll be available, but it won't be free. I mean, it's just what a, a driver wants to see is one or two parking spaces open and waiting for them. Uh, and then to make this politically popular, uh, I recommend spending the meter revenue in the neighborhoods that generate it uh, so that uh, the, the residents will see the benefits of the parking meter. The money will go into the parking meter and uh, come right out the other side uh, to clean the sidewalks and plant street trees and uh, something to give free Wi-Fi to everybody or free transit passes to everybody. So the, 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 the residents and the property owners and the employers will see, I see the benefits of these parking meters because they benefit me as an individual. Um, and then all the other benefits are, are gravy, like slowing global warming. Uh, and then once you've done that, you could remove the off-street parking requirements, which have no intellectual foundation at all. Um, and that will allow uh, infill uh, housing, it will allow higher density, uh, it allow reusing old buildings uh, as restaurants that uh, you can't now because they don't have enough parking to meet the parking requirement. Um, so the first one is the demand-based prices, which is catching on. Uh, when I started uh, uh, preaching about this and uh, publishing my first book, you know, half the planning profession thought I was crazy, and the other half thought I was daydreaming. Uh, but cities are beginning to adopt these policies. Um, you have, if the demand changes over time, say from the morning to the evening or from one block to the next, you have to adjust the prices so that they will uh, um, be higher at times of high demand and low or, or free at times of low demand. About 85%, about one out of every space, every eight spaces would be uh, available. Uh, and it's the lowest price the city could charge and still have a, 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 a availability. Um, so that you can't say that there's not enough parking. Uh, now, nobody wants to pay for parking, including me, and I assume you. Uh, but uh, that maybe paying for parking is better than, than not having any curb parking at all available. Well, San Francisco was one of the first cities that uh, went whole hog on this, and they, uh, they uh, first thing they did was to hire a graphic designer. I think that's the first thing I've learned, is the best thing I've learned is have a graphic designer who's great at Photoshop and, 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 uh, and, and images to say, well, what's the problem? Uh, the, the SF Park is the name of uh, San Francisco's policy of charging the right price for curb parking. And the problem is, that on some blocks that all the spaces are open and on other blocks uh, there, there are quite a few uh, open. So the policy would be to nudge the price up on the top block and nudge it down on the bottom block so that you shift one car <laughs> from the crowded street to the uncrowded street. Now some people think that, that uh, charging you know, market prices for parking is just too big a social change for 
our societies to have was almost like prohibition or the reformation, you know, that it's just, uh, it's, it's in the too hard box, uh, that we, we can't do this. Um, but, but I think that uh, it's not that difficult and San Francisco uh, started doing it. Uh, that they, this is this, we went through this before. The, um, the I'll have to <laughs> get through some slides fairly quickly. I don't know how this happened. So it's the Goldilocks price for park. Not too high, not too low, but just right. And uh, here was an image of what we found in Westwood Village in, um, in Los Angeles, next to the UCLA campus. When all the spaces were occupied, there were, there were uh, two cars circling every block, on average. And if you get the price, it took only about three minutes to find the space. That isn't very much, is it? But in three minutes, you traveled half a mile. Um, and uh, if everybody drove half a mile uh, before they parked, that's a lot of EMT. We calculated that that is, um, in a day, uh, for all the parking spaces in Western Village, more than the distance across the United States. And in a year, it's the distance of four trips to the moon in a car in Little Westwood Village, 15 blocks. Just if everybody who was hunting for parking uh, traveled um, uh, two and a half times around the block. So the, it's sort of one of the hidden costs of parking. When you see cars driving around, you don't know whether they're cruising for parking or going someplace. It, and say in Salt Lake City, I suspect most of them are going someplace, but they would, you, if you began to reduce off-street parking rights, you have to charge for on-street parking. Uh, San Francisco also had the money to, uh, to do uh, interesting video showing what they expected to happen. And here it is, this is probably the, the, the watching this is more important than listening to him. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time consuming. It's estimated close to a third of city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for a space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. These cars slow down public transit and get in the way of emergency vehicles. And drivers focused on finding parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. SF Park's goal is to have at least one parking space available per block. That way drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steadier flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. Newly installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability and rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help people decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SFMTA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meter parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are plentiful, rates will decrease until most of the empty spaces fill, or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. SF Park. Well, this policy has now been copied in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., and Boston and Seattle. So other cities are doing it. And the technology for handling is getting so much better and so much cheaper um, that I hope it will be uh, spreading even faster. Uh, and people thought that this was surge pricing. Uh, you often hear this is surge pricing for Parker. 
Uh, but most prices actually declined in, 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 uh, in San Francisco. Um, the, uh, many more had fallen down to the minimum price of 25 cents an hour because so many uh, blocks had been overpriced in the morning. If you have the same price all day long and demand changes, it's going to be overpriced at some times and underpriced at other times. It means you've had different prices at different times of the day. And they only, the prices only change, price structure only changes once every uh, a couple of months. Um, but they just, look at, they just look at what they had seen in the previous two months and they adjust the prices. And I can't, how else would you set the price of parking other than looking at the results? That's the only way you can get the price right to say, what do I want to see on the street? And then I can just look at the street and say, if all the spaces are full, the price is too low. If all, a lot of spaces are empty, the price is too high. Everybody can become an expert on parking. The city council members set the policy that they want to see, the, of what they want to see on the street. And all the city council has to do is to look at the results to see whether the Department of Transportation is doing its job. And a lot of parking should be free, uh, because even when it's free, it's not all fully occupied. Uh, and it'll only go up uh, if, the, if there's no <laughs> spaces available. And, and the, the uh, businesses benefited. This, they looked at the sales tax revenue and the areas that were right priced versus the areas that they didn't change the price, the control group. And the sales tax went up faster uh, with, uh, uh, with the right pricing because um, people would, uh, like, like an image, they would park, they buy something, and then they'd leave. Uh, somebody else can take their space. Now, many people think, well, this is too difficult how you would do that, because most people think that uh, the parking meters are the, uh, the same as this, this is the first parking meter in the United States in 1935. And functionally, it's the same as most parking meters now, except it's more streamlined, is that you you uh, put your coin in and you hope to get back uh, before your money runs out. How many other pricing systems have not changed since 1935? We have, now we've had, they paying for, with your cell phone or with credit cards or uh, barcodes and everything else like that. All kinds of commerce have changed, but parking meters are the same as they were in 1935. Uh, they were opposed in 1935. Uh, they actually went to the Supreme Court before. <laughs> and they, they, they called it a, an, an infernal combination of, of a slot machine and an alarm clock. Uh, you hope you get back before your time ran out. But modern parking meters are much more sophisticated. And even this one is old fashioned now. This is on the UCLA campus. It doesn't tell you what the price of parking is until you press any button. And then it tells you what the price is at that time. And there are four different price structures during the day. Now, maybe it's, it's, it's four, uh, $3 for the first hour and $4 for the second hour. Is that too much to charge students uh, on, the, on the campus? Well. I suppose many of you realize that the professors have a lot of spare time on their hands. So I set up my camera across from eight parking spaces and looked at what happened during the hour. And you should be able to say, well, is the price right? Well, here's the first picture I took. You'll see the shadows move. It's every uh, four minutes I took pictures. Of. This is what you like to see, one open space. Anybody arriving would say, well, this is great. And you can see somebody paying at the meter on the, on the left. I think she has something to read on. Four minutes later, one car had left and one car had arrived. Uh, another four minutes later, once there was all spaces taken, four minutes later there was a space available. And if this is a city block, even though one block has uh, all spaces taken at, at, at one minute, you could go to another block and if you find another space, that's fine. Sometimes there were two spaces. Um, But pretty, it, it worked pretty well. So one time there were three spaces, but it filled up. So I think that uh, uh, this, this is probably what you would like to see. And do you see this in the parking spaces outside the uh, stores in Salt Lake City? Is this what you see all day long? 
that always there are one or two open spaces, people coming and going all the time and paying. <laughs> I think that it takes a lot of planning to figure out, well, what should we do? The right price it should be higher? Well, no, uh, because that would mean that a lot of it would be empty spaces. Should it be lower? No. Uh, because then more people would find no spaces available than have to drive around. Uh, it's the Goldilocks principle. It's also like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. The right price for bargaining is, I know it when I see it. Uh, that there's no other way, there no, you don't hire a consultant to do any modeling for you, you don't do any predictions at all. You just look back at what happened. Um, so. Uh, I think this is the easiest way to set, to set prices. It's the way, it's the way uh, businesses set prices as well. They have sales for things that don't sell, or they raise prices if they're out of, if there's a high demand. Um, so everybody knows now that uh, the information age, information wants to be free, but parking wants to be paid for. Uh, so we avoid cruising for curb parking. Nobody will be driving around. Here's uh, studies of, of what percentage of the traffic is cruising for parking uh, or how long it took to find a space. These were taken over the past almost 90 years um, uh, uh, on four continents in something like 18 cities. And they only looked for parking, uh, uh, cruising where they expected to find it. In Salt Lake City, the data would be different at different times. but. In these congested areas where they did the studies, about a third of the traffic was cruising for parking. It took about seven minutes to find the space. Here was a, a diagram of a study that was done in Chicago uh, just before World War II, and they hired uh, students to stand in every corner with uh, uh, watches, and they uh, noted every car that passed, um, uh, got the license plate number and which way it turned, and then they could recreate the path of travel. And so on the lower left, uh, there were some people who were fixated on parking on one block, but on the other blocks, people were, were more experimental. They had high hopes for some things to be different on a different block, but there was a lot of cruising. And we've all done it. Uh, maybe not so much in Salt Lake City, but in other places, that wherever you go, you have done it. Uh, and all we see, and it causes a very dangerous behavior. I've seen in West of them, cars make a, a U-turn in the middle of the street when they see an open space on the other side. Um, and th this leads to very risky <laughs> I, I was able to interview the driver afterwards, and, and she, she, she told me that she always does whatever it takes to get a curb parking space. Um, and now uh, there are a lot of different uh, uses for the curb other than parking. Um, that there are loading zones, um, which are necessary for Uber and Lyft a lot, and bus stops, and no stopping zones, and bike lanes, and bike stations, and outdoor restaurants. And the, giving it over to free or cheap parking is, is, is taking land away that could be used and a lot, and a lot uh, more things. I wonder if this is, the, here was a picture that uh, a, a guy did uh, showing uh, parking on one side of the street, a, a bike station on the other side of the street in New York, and in the hour, a hundred, no, 200 people came and left from that bike station in the hour, and 11 people came from the three parked cars on the parking space on the right on the right hand side. So when you say we can't take away parking because uh, for bike stations or uh, or, or Lyft or Uber. Uh, they're not paying attention to what the curb should do. There was a student at uh, UCLA who studied this in, in uh, uh, West Hollywood in, in the evening, and he, he looked at uh, the, about a curb for, uh, uh, that's used for, for parking and loading zones, and those are two ways to get to West Hollywood, uh, and uh, about uh, three times as many people arrived and left uh, from a given amount of space devoted to loading zones than to parking. 
So if you're really wanting to help businesses, it would be better to shift some of those parking spaces, which will deliver one or two people per car, and the cars will stay there for an hour or three or four hours, rather than people coming in Uber and Lyft. Um, and they spend so little time at the curb, they make much better use of it for the uh, merchants. Um, and if you don't have space for, uh, for, for loading zones, it means that there's a lot of double parking that, uh, that for um, the, uh, the uh, 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 most of the double parked cars in this area were um, uh, Uber and Lyft. And, um, they didn't uh, double park for a long time, but they added up to an awful lot of double parking. Um, and very little of the space was devoted to uh, loading zones. Um, the, the West Hollywood, I understand, is very different from Salt Lake City. <laughs> in, in the evening, you know, it's, it's uh, sort of people reveling and drinking and uh, uh, enjoying themselves. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a debauched way, uh, but when they they're, they're drinking, so they want to go home by Uber and Lyft, and they plan to arrive by Uber and Lyft. Uh, but they uh, uh, the the city is not taking care of them by dedicating more curb parking, more curb space to uh, Uber and Lyft. Um, so I think that. Because there was so much double parking, uh, just just for one minute, it meant that the that the that the, uh, the first lane of traffic was blocked by a car. So we got thirty seven percent of the time. So it's like sort of inviting all this double parking. So I think we could shift space from uh, uh, from from uh, from parking to 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 uh, loading or at least. Uh, uh, no stopping. Um, uh, and it can be dynamic. It could, in the morning, it could be commercial loading. In the middle of the day, it could be for parking. In the evening, it could be for uh, uh, Uber and Lyft. And I think the city could make up for the fact that, that they won't get parking meter revenue by uh, charging Uber and Lyft for uh, picking up and dropping off people in, in crowded areas. Uh, you know, cities want to uh, tax Uber and Lyft because they want the money, uh, but if you're going to tax it, it ought to be done in a sensible way, is to tax them at a time when there is congestion. And then the second policy was parking benefit districts because parking meters are very unpopular uh, because you, you pay and the money disappears. It's as though it would be spent on the Iraq war or something. It has no political uh, uh, benefits to anybody. Uh, and urban planners seem like the worst awful people is that they have their plans on improving the city and they do it by torturing uh, uh, drivers. But when people get the money from parking, they understand that it's, uh, it, it's not un-American to charge people uh, for parking. Um, I think it's a very American value uh, to charge people for what they use, uh, for what they get. Um, this is a scene outside the Los Angeles Coliseum during the 1984 Olympics, but it happens at every, Olymp every, every event at the Coliseum. Uh, they, uh, the residents nearby um, park their own cars uh, on the street and they rent out their driveways um, to, for, um, for the event goers. Uh, it's a very American policy to charge people for what they use. Um, and it works out very well. Uh, Pasadena is a, a wonderful part of Los Angeles. Uh, it, it represents a lot of what's happening in many parts of LA and other cities, there were wonderful buildings in terrible condition. It was a, a thriving residential, a commercial area of the 1920s and, and earlier, and then it decayed for about uh, uh, 50 years. Uh, and people thought it'll never recover, but the planners knew that if we could recover it, it would be a wonderful place. If somehow we could revive it, it would be terrific. And it was because of a parking benefit district. Um, 
The city wanted to put in parking meters and the, uh, the merchants and property owners said, no way, it'll chase away the few customers we have. And finally the city said, well, if we put in the parking meters, we will return all the meter revenue to Old Pasadena um, to pay for all the improvements you want. We will rebuild every sidewalk. We will replace all the street furniture with historic street lights and uh, wonderful tree grades and new street trees. We'll clean up the alleys. We'll do everything the public sector can do if it had the money. And they had the money. It was over uh, $1.5 million a year in a small uh, commercial district. And then the merchant said, well, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run the meters till midnight. Let's run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. And the only thing that changed was they said that if we put in the parking meter, the, the, the general fund won't get the revenue. Your neighborhood will get the revenue. And they quickly understood that. Uh, so they borrowed uh, money uh, against the meters. You can borrow against parking meter revenue. They made all the physical improvements. And then even after the debt service, they had $700,000 a year to pay for. They pressure washed the sidewalks twice a month. They cleaned them every night. They removed graffiti every night. Uh, sometimes they have mounted police officers uh, to, to, to increase the sense of security, which is unnecessary, but it looks great. Um, here's a quote from, they, they appointed a, a, a zoning advisory board for the, so the, the uh, uh, local uh, merchants and property owners and residents could uh, recommend what to do with the money. And they said, once we found out that we would get the money, it was an easy sell. Uh, parking meters are not an easy sell, especially if you're going to run them till midnight and charge a high price. Um, so it, it, it led to huge changes. Uh, and they put you know, slogans on the meters explaining where the money went, what we're aiming to do. Uh, it was before and, and after. You know, decades of paint and grime were taken off. Very expensive to do historic preservation. It wasn't worth it until the city improved all of the public services. Um, it was a tire warehouse that had been empty for decades. Um, and it uh, became a Saks Fifth Avenue with no parking. Um, in a typical alley, you know, with mattresses and dead animals and things like that, they put the wires underground and created wonderful walkways where everybody comes to Pasadena so they can walk around in the, in the neighborhoods and enjoy it. It's the most walkable place in Southern California. It went from a commercial skid row to one of the most desirable places for, for visitors in California. Another uh, small town up the coast, Ventura, uh, the, the, the parking meters had been torn out uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and the city council was, uh, was voted out of office and all the merchants, all the ele elected officials knew that parking meters were, were, were toxic until they said, if we put in the parking meters, all the money will go to uh, pay for uh, Main Street services. Um, and they, um, uh, they, they, because they have meters, they had to have um, meter enforcement people, police cadets, who were uniformed officers wandering around, <laughs> uh, you know, helping, explaining the parking meters and things like that and giving tickets. And it led to a, a, a major reduction in crime just because there, there was an official presence in the neighborhood. And they gave free Wi-Fi to everybody uh, through the meter system. So that when the, um, uh, when you go to a coffee shop or a restaurant, you open your laptop to use Wi-Fi. It isn't courtesy of Starbucks or, or anything like that. It's courtesy of the parking service. Because you have meters, you have free Wi-Fi. Uh, I think one of the, the niftiest uses is in Boulder, Colorado, which does almost everything right, uh, that they put in parking meters, and they use the revenue to provide free transit passes to everybody who works downtown. So if you work downtown, you get a free transit pass paid for by the, by the parking meters. So the employers have a tax-free fringe benefit that they give to all their employees paid for by the parking meters. And many of the parking meters are, of course, used by people who are from out of town. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's a very clever system that it suits even people who think all the meter revenue should go to pay for public transit.
you know, because there is a public transit lobby and the meters, they want the meter revenue. And say in San Francisco, they do give the meter revenue to public transit. But if you give it to transit passers, the still the transit system gets all the revenue um, uh, from, the, from the meters and they get a lot of new riders. Uh, because everybody who works downtown can, can ride for free. And everybody who gets a free transit pass knows that it's paid for by the parking meters, and the employers know it's paid for by the parking meters. So not only does it help the public transit system, who gets all the money effectively, but it also provides an individual benefit to everybody downtown. So that is one way um, to make parking meters popular. Uh, which policy do you think will be more popular in a parking benefit district? Providing transit passes for everyone or simply telling everyone that the meter revenue will be used to subsidize public transit? If you knew the money was going to go to subsidize public transit, how big a difference do you think that will make in your life? Um, uh, which revenue, use of the revenue, do you think will generate more public support for parking meters? So I think these parking benefits, they have two roles, that so they're a transportation demand management tool. They, um, uh, they manage the demand for curb parking and they reduce the traffic congestion, the air pollution and fuel consumption, but they're also an economic development tool, like in Pasadena, uh, in Ventura. They, uh, they, they, they make the curb parking available so every, nobody will say there's no place to park downtown. Uh, they increase the sales, uh, the property tax revenue, uh, and they employ uh, people. Say that the, in the parking benefit districts, they use the money to provide you know, the clean and safe uh, function. Usually um, entry level uh, people who do the street sweeping, you know, the graffiti removal. Uh, in Los Angeles, it's often, um, uh, it's got an organization called Chrysalis, which is helping to make helping people to make the transition from homelessness to, to, to work. Uh, because it isn't that difficult to learn how to sweep a street, but people will learn how to show up for work and, and, um, and stay at work all day, and, and they, they, they earn a living. So I think that um, there, are a lot of, there, there, there are a lot of benefits of, uh, of doing this. I guess I went through this before. I don't know how these slides get <laughs> got in, but I think there's a lot of ideological support across the spectrum, whether you, you're on the left or on the right. There's a lot to, to agree to. It's a market-oriented policy, uh, but it benefits the, our public life. Um, so regardless of your politics, uh, you, you have something, you could see something that fits with your political views, um, that uh, liberals like to see more public spending, uh, that we think that we, we have private affluence and public squalor, our you know, sidewalks are dirty and unkempt, and our trees are dying. Um, and the conservatives will see that it's a very market-oriented policy, is that we're charging the right prices, let, it, let the market handle it, not let planners handle it with minimum parking requirements, something that they really uh, are, are, are playing with mud pies, except that we have to eat the mud that they produce. Um, uh, environmentalists have got a lot to, to gain from this policy, um, uh, because it, it reduces all the things that, that they're trying to reduce. Uh, and businesses will see that, it, you mean I can open a restaurant without having uh, 10 parking spaces per thousand square feet? Well, this is terrific. Um, and the new urbanists will see that you could um, have a better looking city and you won't be overrun by cars. Uh, the, the, the market will be limiting the number of cars because without minimum parking requirements and with market prices for car parking, if the market is handling all these difficult decisions on who, who gets which parking where. And libertarians will like it um, because it's left, everything is left up to individual choices. Um, and property rights advocates can see that, you mean the government is not telling me what to do with my property? They won't say exactly how many parking spaces I have to have, no matter how much they cost, and no matter whether many of them end up being empty. 
Um, certainly developers have got a lot to gain from this because they could build more housing and less parking. Um, and the residents will see that it's, it's paying for public services in their neighborhood. And certainly affordable housing advocates will see that you mean I can build uh, uh, housing for people who don't own a car and I will charge lower rents? That sounds like a very good idea. Uh, and then the neighborhood activists will see that these parking benefit districts, they're the ones who make the decisions of what should we spend the money on. Um, and I think the biggest beneficiaries will be local elected officials. And they won't have to sit through endless council meetings about what should be the parking requirement for this or that, or what should be the parking meter rate in this street or on that street, and having to pretend to be experts on parking when they don't know anything more than you do. Um, and, and, uh, it'll relieve them from a lot of unpleasant council meetings of people complaining about the parking requirements are too high or too low, or the <laughs> parking meter rates are too high or too low, and why is there so much congestion and things like that. Well, what will we do with all the cars that we won't need? Here's a sculpture in France called Long-Term Parking, um, which I like. Uh, what about all the parking garages that we've built? Uh, uh, we've invested a lot of this. What, could, what better use could we have? Here's one in Holland. That's just a ramp going up to the levels. Uh, here's a solution that I like, that uh, much better use of, the, of our parking structures. Well, the urban planner can't do anything better than um, end with a quote from, from Jane Jacobs. Um, um, we aren't a wealthy country because of what you and I have done. Uh, we live in a wealthy country because of, of what we were born here. Uh, and we owe a lot to the past. Um, uh, and I don't think our generation is making as many gifts to the future as the past has made to us. Um, um, there are other people you could quote to say that our current policies are wrong. This is from uh, President Eisenhower's famous military industrial complex speech in his farewell. And I think we seem to be plundering the resources of tomorrow at a rate that uh, uh, President Eisenhower could not have imagined. Now that global warming is potentially a problem, uh, we worry about affordable housing, uh, and yet we have fixated on making the world better for cars uh, so that we can have free parking. And then our, our greatest uh, presidential writer, of course, is Abraham Lincoln, and I think our case is new. Uh, the technology of charging for parking is so much better than it was in the past. Um, and I think it's time to think anew about parking and to act anew. Uh, now, you, you probably don't often hear a professor ending a lecture with quotes from two Republican presidents. Um, but I suspect that all of our presidents would agree with Eisenhower and, and Lincoln. Despite all the inertia in urban planning, uh, reforms are sprouting. Uh, cities are removing off-street parking reforms. They are charging for on-street parking. They are creating parking benefit districts. The paradigm shifts in urban planning are often barely noticeable uh, while they're happening. And afterward, it's hard to tell that anything has changed. So that we, we make new turns and planning so fast we forget where we're going in the other direction. We, now, we, we once did urban renewal and now we do historic preservation. We once did high-rise public housing and now we have scattered site public housing. Uh, we realized we were going in exactly the wrong direction and I think with parking policies we are going in exactly the wrong direction. Everything I'm recommending is the opposite of what we're doing now. We now require off-street parking. I said, no, you shouldn't require any. Um, uh, most on-street parking is free. Um, uh, and I think most of it should be charged. And, and when we do charge for on-street parking, we pour the money into the general fund. And I say, well, no, it should not go in the general fund. It go back to the neighborhood where it came from. But no matter um, uh, 
how fast these improvements happen. And uh, I think that we'll always have a parking problem. That will never disappear unless General Motors succeeds on this new, new, new development that, that they've, they've kept under wraps. Um, here's a, a short uh, clip that, that escapes that shows what could happen in the future. Um, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to, to talking to you all afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shoup, and we hope you've enjoyed uh, this first portion of our uh, luncheon today. Ladies and gentlemen, we would encourage you to write down in the middle of your table, there's some blank uh, uh, cards and some pens if you need them. Uh, any questions you would like to ask the panel, and our staff will be around to collect those shortly, and so we would encourage uh, your participation there. I'd like now to introduce uh, my colleague, our director for uh, regional planning and transportation, Mr. Will Summercorn. Well, welcome. Thanks all for being here, and we thank Professor Shoup. We really appreciate his coming here and uh, giving us this information and the uh, a different way of thinking a little bit about parking. Um, before I introduce our panelists, uh, we're going now to go right into our panel discussion, which will uh, we'll get a little bit more information from some of our, our, new, our panelists that will join us, and then questions from you all. I just want to give a thanks to the staff here from our department that has helped out. Uh, they've been great in putting this together and in organizing and doing all of the great work. It's our staff are Jake Young, Helen Peters, Jana Osler, uh, Sam Sedevic, and Jennifer Terrazon. Um, and give them a hand, I think. They've been a great job. All right, with that, I want to introduce our panelists and have them come up now. And then uh, from uh, the two that will join us, we're going to ask them to take just a couple of minutes and give you a little bit of their perspective on issues related to parking that they have dealt with. Um, and then we'll uh, go right into the questions that you may have. Uh, and again, as uh, Carlton mentioned, use those cards that you have at your table, and our staff will be around to pick those up. Just Hold the card up when you have it, when you filled out, and someone will come around to pick it up. Our first panelist uh, is Mark Isaac. Mark uh, is a, when I asked him, how would you like me to introduce you? And he said, oh, I just am a guy who does some things. And uh, he says, make it pretty short. So I will. Mark has a, uh, I guess, a company here locally. But uh, what he does primarily is he is a representative for developers, uh, builders, uh, investors that work on major projects here in our region and our area. Some of the projects that he has uh, represented and essentially been like a project manager for uh, are things like Jordan Landing, uh, the Shopko block on Sugar House, where he's also working on the University Medical Office building now, and the Zeller project along the S line tracks uh, or a, a streetcar line in Sugar House and a number of other projects that Mark has done around the state. So Mark, come on up and join us, if you would. And let's give Mark a hand. And our other panelist is Paul Allred. Paul is the Community Development Director in Holiday City. I didn't know whether they call you City Planner, whatever. Community Development Director. I know Paul well. Uh, when I was at Davis County, we hired Paul and Paul was one of our planners there, and he only stayed for a little while, then he left there and went to Centerville City as their community development director. And if you ever get the time, ask Paul to tell you the story about his attempt to do a city center development, a community center development in Centerville, and how it all imploded in the end, and they wound up with Walmart. And uh, it was uh, something that the community did not anticipate or want, but it's the way things happen. It's a great story that he has to tell you. Uh, Paul is, uh, has done some great work in, in Holiday, and uh, he will tell us a little bit about some of the experiences he's had there. So come on up, Paul. Uh, 
Um, and then, of course, Professor Shoup will join us as our third panelist, and we'll be up here to also answer some questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it uh, to each of our two new panelists who've joined us. And they'll take about two to three minutes to introduce a little bit of this topic and why they uh, see this as being a, an important topic. So we'll start with Mark, then we'll go to Paul, and then we'll do your questions. Thank you. My name is Mark Isaac. I recognize a lot of you in the audience. Uh, I was the land use planner by education and worked on the government side as a planner and economic development analyst early in my career. And as my planner friend said, I went to the dark side in 1997 and I've been representing investors in equity and developers since 1997. Um, one thing that really struck me today listening to the professor is it reminded me of Professor Carr and Professor Emmy at Urban Planning at the University of Utah years ago who said always, they constantly reiterated that planning, planning principles, master plans, general plans are constantly morphing documents. They're constantly changing with the advent of development and societal change. What's interesting and what strikes me now listening to the professor is the one thing that's never changed are a lot of our zoning standards. We never change them to accommodate societal shift or development shift. And it really struck me today thinking about it because we're still using very archaic planning standards for parking. Uh, I totally agree, Mark. Uh, my experience as an urban planner, um, I will say I'm guilty as charged. Dr. Shoup, many years ago, I was one of those planners who just quoted chapter and verse on the parking standards and clearly did not understand where they had come from. I assumed that our city, whichever city it was that I had worked for, had just cut and pasted uh, <laughs> from Peoria or wherever it was, which is probably the case. Everybody tends to borrow from each other. and There was really no thought given to uh, parking regulations, and uh, they often were disastrous. Um, over a period of time, uh, became I read a lot of literature and started thinking about effects in the three different communities where I worked, and now, um, I'll just take a minute and talk about our, our mixed-use downtown area. We have a revitalized downtown area, and there are just little, 10 little bullet points I'd like to talk about just quickly. We set out for, to do some placemaking, and uh, I think we've created a nice design downtown area that people really like. The idea was that uh, large parking lots would hinder our ability to have a great place, because if you have large parking lots at four, five, six stalls per thousand, it pushes buildings apart. So it becomes antithetical to the creation of place. Buildings need to be close to the street and they need to be closer together. That's what creates that nice downtown feel that people like to visit. Uh, we have limited our parking. Our parking is about two and a half stalls per thousand in our downtown area and it's working. We encourage shared parking. Uh, we have noticed that we have very low turnover in our downtown area. I don't know of a business that is left because of the restricted parking. Everyone was fearful about these uh, parking uh, ratios, including our planning commission and our elected officials, but as time has gone on, we have found that the restricted parking has not been a hindrance. Um, we uh, find that even our busiest uses, uh, we have a brand new Harmons in our downtown area, even at its busiest time, uh, Friday at about noon, it's 90, maybe 100% full. The rest of the week, it's well below that, and Everyone was fearful when that use was proposed that we would never have enough parking. It simply isn't true. There are a lot of myths with parking, and one of them is that there just isn't enough parking. There may not be the parking stall right next to the front door, but there is ample parking. Uh, we are, we, our goal in our downtown area it was to look for efficient parking, not in, uh, instant gratification in terms of a stall anytime, anywhere. And we have found that it has worked. Again, that, that whole convenience is a matter of mindset. Patience is key. We have to let people get used to the new standards now that the buildings have been in place for two to three years and two new ones have just come in. Uh, we've got to be patient as a community and let people discover that they, you can't always have a nose-in parking stall the second you want it. You learn to adjust the times that you come to a use. You might come 11.30 for lunch or you might uh, go in the middle of the afternoon instead of uh, when everybody's trying to go. Uh, we encourage shared parking and partnerships. We built some on-street parking for a medical clinic in our downtown area. When we returned, 
We got them to grant us the use of their entire parking lot, about 90 stalls, uh, you know, after five o'clock every weeknight and completely open on the weekend. So look for partnerships. We need some wayfinding signage that would help a little bit. We still have some work to do. Uh, finally, just the last item, uh, we, what we like to say and what I think is that if you don't build it, they'll still come. We have people from back east who have relocated to Utah. They moved to Holiday. I often interview them informally on the street and I'll say, hey, uh, where are you going? They'll say, we're going down to the village. We're going down to the plaza. Where are you from? Oh, we're from Minnesota. We're from New Jersey. We're from California. Why did you come to Holiday? Because we like this downtown area. And I, I'll ask them, how far are you walking? And they'll say, well, we're from a mile and a half. They'll walk a mile, mile and a half in each direction for that ambiance. So that restricted parking, the use, you know, uh, just making it, changing the model uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be a failure. But there's a lot of fear in doing that. All right. Well, um, let yeah. me, Mark, let me, please. Uh, let me just add a couple examples of current projects I'm working on. I think it'll be sort of a stimulus to I was about to ask you about that, yeah. Thank this you. Is, this is an interesting one. We just opened a 300-unit multifamily project on the S line, on the streetcar line in South Salt Lake. So it's on 300 East and 2250 South. It's right, right next to the Kimball Cooking School. When we went through the approval process, the S line had just opened. We were the first multifamily project that oriented the front doors to an actual transit stop along the streetcar line through Sugar House in South Salt Lake. We were required to provide 468 stalls of parking for the approval of that development with the city. On a transit line, on a pedestrian and a bike lane, and all the reasons that if there's ever the opportunity to have lenient parking standards, that is the perfect example. We've just recently finished construction. We started leasing in April. We've leased half the facility so far. We have 150 units leased, and we have 147 stalls spoken for. I have gone from 1.6 units, 1.6 parking stalls per unit, to now I have 2.2 parking stalls per unit left for the last 150 stalls, or last 150 units. It was a $6 million parking structure. It added $21,000 a door to the construction cost, and we're not gonna use half the parking on the site. It's fascinating how much we invest in parking in a perfect circumstance for the communities along the Wasatch Front to be creative with their parking standards, and we're going to have a surplus of stalls there in perpetuity, and that's a pretty expensive uh, waste of stalls. And then the other thing, uh, I saw Russ Fox sitting out in the audience here. We worked together on the Jordan Landing for years, just up the street here in West Jordan. The first phase of the Jordan Landing is 80 acres. There's still 41 acres of asphalt sitting out there. 20 years later, 41 acres of asphalt. If we could redevelop some of that area, can you imagine what we could do for sales tax revenue, property tax valuations, and employment centers in our community? And the interesting dynamic to it is a lot of the barrier to that change isn't the city, it's the retailers. And I think that we're starting to see a fairly significant shift. Fred Bruning was in town recently. I think some of you are pretty familiar with him on some real big retail plays here in Utah. And he told me that they're now having 60, 70, 80, upwards of 100 Uber and Lyft drop-off stalls built into all their shopping centers and they're reducing the parking ratios dramatically in other markets. And I think these types of changes are the perfect opportunity or opening salvo for the planners and the planning staff to say to their electeds and appointed, you know, it's time we make a change. Great, I oh, appreciate that. Um, Press Shoot, did you have a comment or did something you wanted to add? And Mark, if you'd hand the mic over to him. Well, um, I have this, I, I, I agree that uh, oh, as yeah. you said, that, that um, plans change over time. Uh, and they're morphing in one direction or another. But I think our, our, our planning for parking was wrong right from the beginning. It isn't that it was once right, it, and now it's wrong. It was wrong at the beginning, it's even wronger now. Um, 
you know, consider, suppose, suppose Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller at the, at the dawn of the automobile age, suppose the, they had asked urban planners, what policies can you recommend that would increase the demand for cars and fuel? Well, here are some options. One, separate land uses, housing here, jobs there, um, shopping someplace else. So this will create the demand from one area to another. And then we limit density, so to spread things further apart. So that will further increase the amount of travel. And then let's require off street parking everywhere. So that cars will be the, nat which will further spread things apart and make cars the natural way to travel. And I think those are essentially, from the beginning, our urban planning policies. Those three elements of separating land users, limiting density, requiring off street parking, they were wrong from the beginning and they're wrong now. Um, I think the upside of this is that it leaves a lot of land available for better uses, for infill development, uh, for, uh, for more housing, uh, if we let it happen. And I think uh, that, uh, that nothing can happen unless the zoning allows it. Uh, zoning is really to prevent changes in many ways. So I think that, uh, yes, I hope that the planning will change and make a new turn that, that all three of our base, those are the three basic policies of, 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 of zoning, is separating land uses, um, limiting density, and requiring parking. The first two are just saying what's allowed uh, the, in, each, in each area. The third, parking requirements, they're different, and they came later than the first two. That they say what you must do is very different from uh, from uh, separating land uses and limiting density. Saying you, what you can and you can't do everywhere. They say what you must do everywhere. Uh, so I think that the, the sooner we make a U-turn on these policies, the better off we'll be. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go to some of your questions, uh, and I want to start with this one because this relates directly to the comment that Mark just made. Um, it, the question is this, can you please address further how reducing parking requirements in residential areas or projects can help with housing affordability? And uh, you just heard Mark talk about what the cost is in a project such as uh, he's been working on where they are uh, building structured or underground parking and how much that costs per parking space. That of course has to be um, costed out to the units themselves and which adds to the cost of that. I just, for example, you say, well, what about other types of housing projects where you, there may be not such high density? I just recently heard about a community that was considering uh, uh, an ordinance to allow for accessory dwelling units. But as part of that requirement, they were thinking of requiring that the, uh, the home where their accessory dwelling units may be allowed had to have a minimum of six parking spaces. Now, you can imagine what that does to the cost. I mean, would you, uh, Alice? Well, I'm, I'm programming a new project on in the Granary District and one downtown on 200 South right now, and 23% of the cost of construction on both those projects are parking alone. So, you know, you, you reduce the cost of construction by reducing the amount of parking required, and every one of you that are working in these various communities along the Wasatch Front have seen a tremendous uptick in podium parking, five over framing. It's the most efficient way we can build. The reason you're seeing it everywhere is it's the most cost efficient way we can build multifamily right now. But still 22 or 23% of the cost of construction is in providing parking stalls. And so you wanna be able to reduce the, the amount of rent required to pay for that debt, you reduce the amount of parking required and most of those parking standards are established by the cities. Uh, yeah, we, our experience has been pretty interesting too. We, uh, for example, in our downtown area, which has a different parking standard than the rest of the city, we need to get to the rest of the city to address those standards, which need to be changed, but we have actually capped our parking in our downtown area. You cannot build more than 
a certain number of stalls per thousand. And it's two and a half for both retail and uh, you know, a commercial retail restaurant. A restaurant that's one stall per four seats. So we have capped our office and retail at two and a half. And we've said, if you really need more, you can ask for no more than a little bump. You can ask for 25% more. We actually had one retailer come in and say, well, a big development, the Harmons development came in and said, look, we have to have more than that or we can't make it work. So we did a text amendment, but we only gave it a slight bump over the other businesses because they, they needed to know that they would have enough parking to make it work. So it was a little bit of a challenge for our city to kind of relinquish control over those two and a half stalls per thousand. But again, we find that this axiom is true. For every nine by 20 stall that you have, that's nine by 20 feet. That's 180 square feet of area that you can't lease. You can't rent. It can't be used for economic development. So if you don't find the Goldilocks solution for parking, that delicate balance, and over park or under park, it can be disastrous. And, and we've been doing it wrong for a long time. We hope, we think it's really working while we're at, but we think that cap has helped. And I uh, had an interesting discussion with one of our developers today, the developer who did our clock tower buildings and the Harmons building. He said that uh, the biggest hurdle he's had in having people come in is that the tenants, they're demanding four and five stalls per thousand, and they don't even understand that they don't need it. And so, he pointed out to a group, we had a tour group today in our village, uh, about 20 people came down to tour our village and, they, and he said to that group, he said, you know what's interesting is that we haven't lost any tenants. All these folks who wanted all this parking, we convinced them, gave them a low lease rate to get them in here and they're all doing well. We haven't lost anybody even with the restricted parking that the city has adopted. So it's a delicate balance. Um. To Paul's point, um, when I, and one of the questions that we have from our audience relates to that very issue. And uh, when I was uh, at Salt Lake City, during my time at Salt Lake City, we worked on some of the parking requirements there. And we actually were looking at uh, uh, putting in place some parking maximums, not allowing more than a certain number of parking spaces uh, based on some standards. And the interesting comment that we got from some of the developers that, were, uh, that we talked to with regard to that, they said, well, we don't have a problem with that. We, in fact, we would really like to be able to do less parking. But our tenants, the potential tenants, and the financers all seem to think we need more parking and are demanding more parking. Otherwise, they won't lease with us or they won't finance our project. And so uh, I think, I, I think, I hope that's changing. Um, but it certainly has been an issue. And it's, it's one of those uh, things that I guess it, you kind of need to go around. Any comments from the panelists on that? Uh, well, but yes, uh, uh, two comments. First on your uh, the accessory dwelling units. I think that um, uh, in, in resident single family housing areas, the, the single biggest opportunity for affordable housing is to allow people to convert their garages into apartments. It's done illegally all the time, uh, but not legally. Uh, because the garage is required for the but <laughs> for the parking, uh, and the city says if you want to convert that garage into in, in, into an apartment, you have to replace the the parking spaces and add parking for the for the ADU. Well, we've had state legislation in California saying that cities must allow people to convert their garages uh, into apartments without any any new parking, and I think that some of the the most Wonderful opportunities for affordable housing is the, uh, all the, the the snout houses that have garages poking out in front. That normally you think of an ADU as something in the backyard, but I think there's so many garage doors that you can see from the front of the house that shows a garage that could become an apartment, and it would make the house look better if it were changed into. Uh, uh, appropriately matching the rest of the house so that the half of the front of the house is not taken over by a garage door but by a bay window for example. Uh, so I think that if we allow accessory dwelling units it will be a, a terrific improvement. Uh, the, as I understand it now the, the share of young adults who live with their parents is at an all-time high uh, because of the cost of housing and if you're going to have children living with you, I think it's better that they live in the garage. Um, uh, and if it's facing the front, you have your own entrance to the front, 
um, you have your, uh, it's really like a, a separate unit that you, the, the, the homeowner doesn't lose any privacy in the backyard. Um, so I think that the ADUs are a, a terrific opportunity, but they're prohibited by most zoners. Uh, and that's something that can be changed. The second question was about retail. Yeah, on retail. Hmm? With uh, the retail, the requirements that tenants and financers have with regard to. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's always a, uh, an excuse that planners give. It's not our fault. It's the, it's the, the banks. They won't lend. Um, well, what about the cities that don't have parking requirements? Is there no lending there? Uh, when, when Portland shifted, uh, removed all the off street parking requirements throughout most of the city, uh, the banks weren't used to that. So all the, the, it only took for a short while, they said, well, we'll go to San Francisco banks. They know how to lend for buildings that don't have any parking or less parking. And it was very easy to get uh, 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 loans from banks that know how to do it. And then in a competitive market, the banks here will learn how to do it. Um, but I think that the, in research that has been done on whether the banks are the, the, the source of the problem, it was done, research was done in LA and then replicated in Chicago. They interviewed developers, banks, um, developers and banks saying that, uh, uh, do you object to having uh, reduced parking requirements? And they all, the, 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 the banks all said that we want to make sure that the, every building has all the required parking so there'll be no challenge to the um, uh, entitlement later on, saying that this, build, this building uh, violated the zoning code when it was built. So they ensure definitely that every building must have all the required parking, but they never required more. And this seemed unusual, so the Chicago Transit Authority did the same research in, in Chicago, and they found exactly the same result, is that most people provided only the amount of required parking, never more, uh, suggests that the parking requirements are the binding uh, uh, element in, in, in our system, that banks can learn very quickly if they see other banks financing uh, buildings, and especially in a prosperous area like Salt Lake, I don't think banks would be taking much of a chance on uh, financing a building that had less than the normal amount of parking. And I think that the problem is that the parking requirements have almost become a religion in planning. It's, it's that, that we believe that, that in this. Um, well, when it comes to parking, and I, I realize you should never criticize anybody else's religion. But when it comes to parking requirements, I'm a Protestant. Uh, and I believe this nation needs a reformation. Um, let me ask, let me add to that retail question a little bit. I was just thinking about the work you've been doing, Paul, in the downtown holiday area. We've got a big project in Sugar House. I bought the Shopco site in Sugar House. It had 575 surface parking stalls for that Shopco in the heart of Sugar House. Flipping, I'm a bit of a hypocrite because I'm replacing it with 1,250 stalls, but I'm putting them underground, burying them, and there's only 180 surface stalls when we're finished. So we're densifying the use. But I think what's happened, a big part of what's happened to retailing and the realization from our changes is we love that exper experiential energy. It's fun to go into Holiday Town Center and go to Talk 27 and go walk those boutiques. Sugar House is on fire right now and it's a pain in the rump to park down there. People go where there's energy. People go where there's a confluence or a collision. Friction creates energy. When was the last time you went somewhere cool and could remember walking across a parking lot? The French Quarter in New Orleans, or Pikes in Portland, or you know Lodo in Denver, Hillcrest in San Diego, Gaslamp in Vancouver. I can go on for an hour of all the cool places we've all been in these cool retail environments and these cool restaurant settings. And it's really fun to go there with your husband or your wife or your kids. And it's because of that confluence. Not one of those places do any of us think of as a conveniently parked setting. 
And I really think that that's sort of the change. We started this big box plan a while back and created massive parking fields for convenience in and out. And we lost all the cool factor and all the energy in retail. Very good point. I, I really like what you said, Mark. Um, I, I've often commented as a planner in dealing with residents who come out and protest every project that's attractive or quaint or is something outside of the box. Like Will mentioned in Centerville, we tried to do a 50-acre mixed-use town center that went over like a lead balloon, even though Envision Utah and the Quality Growth Commission were, were funding the, the project. Peter Calthorpe came out and people just looked at him like he was, in, like he was nuts. Uh, and this guy is a, a absolutely terrific resource. So um, what we have, what I found is that I would say in public meetings, we travel to places that are parking restricted. Old Town San Diego, Coronado San Diego, uh, Santa Barbara. There, we will go to places. New York City. We will travel all over the world to places that are different than ours, and we will say, "What a cool place! How great it was!" But but we don't want it here. The second you propose it here, the people go nuts, and they say, "Well, we can't do that here." This is about our farms, or it's about our schools, or our churches, or whatever. And we don't want coffee shops. We don't want anything cool. Um, and so, in the holiday, it's we're trying to do something that's fun, and that doesn't. It's not all about the car. Certainly, you can drive through the middle of it. You can go and park there. Um, but we have. A, have you even been to the Soho Food Park in Holiday? We have this really cool food truck park at the south end of our village. So our village has three activity centers. City Hall Park, uh, City Hall, and then we have the plaza and the clock tower buildings and the Harmons at the main intersection, and then about a block down, we have this food truck park. The food truck park will get 1,500 people on the weekends. There are 16 stalls. Now, you can't park a food truck park at 16 stalls and make it work without people walking, without people parking and being able to walk a half mile, a quarter mile. A ton of the people who go to the food truck park are coming from the neighborhoods. They're not driving. We have people coming from West Jordan, Bluffdale, other places. They'll drive, but so many of the people who come to that particular use walk and their neighbors and they'll sit there and socialize. These activity centers, like Mark was talking about, they're not based on parking lots. They're based on interaction between people, neighbors and friends and even strangers. So yeah, and parking is not central to doing that. Yeah. And getting back to your, your issue of what makes it an exciting area, that as I was driven into town by Lyft yesterday, I passed, as we got closer to the center of town, I saw the tallest parking structure I've ever seen. Um, and one of the ugliest. Uh, and it reminded me of these studies of whether banks or developers are the ones who really insist on the, on the parking. In the study, one of the developers was quoted, he, they thought that planners knew what the right amount of parking was. They thought that, that somehow that we had figured it out what was the right amount of parking. But he, he was a bit doubtful because he never saw an oil spot on the top deck of his parking structure. And I think I, I always go to the top of a parking structure when I go to a town so you get a great view. And I bet I'll go to the top of that, that parking structure in Salt Lake City and get a great view and I bet I'll not see a single oil spot. Uh, but I think I'm not against planning for parking. I'm heavily in favor of it. But I think that we should regulate the quality of the parking and not the quantity. Uh, cities like, like in, in, in gas lamp area of San Diego and most other places you want to go to, they say that the, uh, the parking always has to have retail on the ground floor. It has to have uh, active users on the ground floor. And in Boulder and some other places, it has to be wrapped. There has to be apartments or offices or everything like that. It looks like it's an office building, even though it's a thin layer of offices surrounding the parking structure. So I think that if we spent much more time on uh, improving the urban design of parking to make it uh, uh, friendly but not free. Uh, I think now we spend more time on making it free and we don't pay much attention to what it looks like. Uh, and I think that, that there's a lot to be done in improving the quality of the parking we have at the expense of we will have a smaller amount. So we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, we promised to have you out here by 1.30 and we will do that. So I want to close perhaps with the last question here. And there, I actually have about three or four here that are related. So I, this will be the question that we ask. Professor Shoup talks about doing away with off-street parking requirements. And instead, 
Uh, of course, parking would be on street. Well, how do you regulate that? And one way is to charge for that parking. Um, it was mentioned that in our region right now, really downtown Salt Lake City is the only place that has parking meters or paid parking on the street. Um, how do you do this in other communities? Is it possible to do paid parking in some of our, like in Holiday, or in other lower density suburban communities? Um, how do you do that when the communities see parking as kind of a way to um, compete for retail development? to uh, say we have plenty of free parking in our community, so come visit us. And how do you also get over that idea of uh, many of our elected officials, that concept of free parking, parking whenever and wherever you want to, is a sacred cow. How do you overcome that? Well, I think that removing a parking requirement does not mean there will be no Wall Street parking. I mean, that, that's a, 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 a very, I, I think people's mental, mental faculties shift to a lower level when they talk about parking. They use the reptilian cortex of their brain, you know, the most primitive part of your brain that was invented to, to, to make fight or flight decisions, how to avoid being eaten. The, the, to say that the, the removing Wall Street parking requirements mean that there won't be any Wall Street parking is absurd. He was just saying they were wanted to provide parking, they just didn't want to provide as much as the city was telling them, that, and it remains empty. So removing Wall Street parking requirements does not mean not having any Wall Street parking. You've already got tons of it. It won't disappear tomorrow. If, if, if not all of it is required, less of it will be built and it will be better uh, uh, looking. So I think that, that that's a mistake. And you, everybody won't be parking on the street, but if you have less off-street parking, you have to charge the right price for the on-street parking. I think that, uh, that there's, there's no, Removing off street parking is also not the same as limiting the amount of parking. Some people think that we should go straight from a minimum parking requirement to a maximum parking limit. And that is sort of like the Soviet maximum, uh, that uh, the Soviet maxim that what is not required must be prohibited. Somehow we can't let it go. We can't let the market handle it. We have, we know how much is either the minimum or the maximum. And when you go from the, sometimes when cities go from a minimum to a maximum, the new maximum is lower than the previous minimum. I mean, how bankrupt could a profession be uh, when their central, uh, <laughs> one of the central features of their planning is, is so mixed uh, uh, up? I'd say when London went from minimum parking requirements to maximum parking limits, it turned to afterwards, and new buildings built afterwards. The, the change had about half the amount of parking as before. So suggesting that really the parking requirements were requiring much more parking than developers were willing to provide. They also put in limits and almost nobody ever built up to the limit. The limit was not binding because you, you could have it, but it didn't have any effect because it was, it was one space per thousand square feet or something like that and most people were willing to pay more for that. So I think it should be uh, it should be allowed to to let the market provide the amount of parking. And if a restaurant wants to open up with no parking, it should be allowed to. I'd flip it a little bit. For me, maybe we should be doing this now to start influencing traffic and transportation decisions and patterns. The University of Utah, for example, used to just be fields of parking. It was a commuter school. Uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, they've sort of developed out most of those parking lots into coverage and buildings. And you look at the rail system and you watch those transit cars go in and out of that campus every day. They are standing room only packed from daybreak to the U, and that's influencing good change. We're in an environment where air quality is a big issue. Maybe cost of parking for 1,500 people visiting food truck Friday and Holiday Town Center influences more families to ride their bikes, influences more people to walk, influences more people to Uber Lyft. I went downtown with my wife a week ago. I just asked the Uber guy, how many times, how many rides has he done so far tonight? He said, I was like his 28th trip into downtown. Well, think of 28 less cars going in and out of downtown by one Uber driver. That's massive. 
those kinds of changes, maybe it's the, the heavy hand we need on the Wasatch Front to start to influence that positive of air quality and less vehicular traffic. I'm a hypocrite, I'm driving up and down the Wasatch Front to five different projects from Provo to West Haven in a Ford F-150. But the flip side is, we Uber in and out of Sugar House to restaurants, we Uber in and out of downtown. And, and I think that we are seeing a societal shift in that. And, 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 it's, and, and maybe some of these parking changes and narrowing that off street parking focus forces us all to look at alternative means. You know, and it's a good point. And, and uh, one of the questions here I had about how, what are autonomous vehicles going to do with the parking requirements? And you look at what Professor Schuchter talked about, about curb space for loading and unloading. And maybe, you know, that's a big part of the change. Paul, any? Yeah, we, we've had that same kind of concern with these new developments. And what, are, what are AV, what's AV going to do? We think it's going to increase the need for more drop-off pickup and less parking stalls. Another thing that helps with reducing parking, for example, in our downtown area, is it's nice if you have good sidewalks, and it's really great if you have bike lanes. If you want to get people there, not in the car, make it attractive and fun. Provide signage, provide uh, the, the striping and the paint and everything else so that people know this is a bike, uh, this is a bike friendly community you want to get there. And see if you can link it to other communities. So we're trying to do that with Prattenwood Heights and Mill Creek. Do all you can that way. You, you raised an interesting point. Sugar House just recently uh, adopted, just a year or two ago, blade signs for their retailers. Anywhere that's pedestrian friendly, Carmel, Park City, you know, we can go on and on and on, allows blade signs. All the other signs that we're building are for vehicular traffic. Well, if you're pedestrian friendly, provide the retailers an opportunity to show their wares and their location to the pedestrians. Little planning changes like that have a massive influence on how we enjoy the built environment. And that's just recently occurred in Sugar House as an example and in Salt Lake City, and that's influencing pedestrian friendly, Holiday Town Center, Soda Row out at Daybreak's doing a beautiful job of that. They're out in the suburbs and they're building this little intense, little community that's very pedestrian friendly. So planning efforts are making great strides and great changes. We're planner world, we're not, we're not all bad guys. But the flip side is, is we can have more influence than I think a lot of times we realize. And it all comes down to parking or at least a lot of it does. Paul Allred, Holiday City, Mark uh, Isaac, and Donald, Professor Donald Shoup. We thank you all for being here today and join me in uh, thanking them for their presentation. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate oh, yeah. your uh, you willingness to come and listen to this, uh, this important information. Thank you. Thank you.